All right, today we're going to dive into a high-stakes molecular mission that happens inside every single bacterial cell. It's a process that's absolutely fundamental to life itself, and, let's be honest, a super important topic for anyone gearing up for exams like the CSIR net. We're talking about prokaryotic DNA replication. So think about this for a second. A single E. coli cell has this circular chromosome with millions of base pairs. So how in the world does it copy that entire instruction manual almost flawlessly in about 20 minutes? That's the big mystery we're going to solve today. It is a true marvel of biological engineering. So how does the cell pull this off? Well, the main strategy is something called semi-conservative replication. Imagine you have a book with two halves bound together. To make a copy, you first separate the two original halves. Then, you create a brand new matching half for each of the old ones. What do you end up with? Two identical books, each one half old and half new. This is how the cell guarantees that each daughter cell gets a perfect identical copy of the genetic blueprint. Here's a quick look at our mission plan. We'll start with the basics, then jump right into the three main phases. That's initiation, elongation, and termination. We're also going to tackle that sometimes tricky concept of the leading and lagging strands, and we'll wrap it all up with a quick-fire review of all the key players, which should be perfect for your exam revision. All right, let's kick things off with phase one, initiation. This is all about how the cell finds the exact starting point on that big circular chromosome and builds this super sophisticated replication factory right on the spot. You know, this whole process can't just start anywhere. There's a designated launch pad, a very specific DNA sequence in E. coli called ORI-C, which stands for the origin of replication. This is ground zero. This is where the entire operation begins. Okay, now this is a really important slide, so pay close attention, especially if you're studying for an exam. This ORI site has some key features. It's got four nine base pair sequences called DNA boxes. Think of these as landing pads. And right next to them are three 13 base pair regions that are super rich in adenine and thymine. And why is that important? Well, A and T are held together by just two hydrogen bonds, while G and C have three. Fewer bonds means it takes less energy to pull them apart. It's like the DNA has a built-in unzip here spot. So, here's how the action unfolds, step by step. First, a bunch of DNA A proteins come in and bind to those DNA boxes. This binding puts stress on the DNA, causing that nearby AT rich region to melt open. As soon as that little bubble forms, another protein called DNA C acts as a loader, bringing in the main unzipping enzyme, DNA B helicase. DNA B then gets to work unwinding the DNA in both directions, which creates two replication forks that start moving away from each other. Okay, so as the DNA is unzipping, you can imagine things could get pretty chaotic. That's where the support crew comes in. These little proteins called single-strand binding proteins, or SSBs, immediately jump onto the exposed single strands to keep them from snapping back together. Meanwhile, as helicase plows forward, it creates a lot of tension and twisting ahead of it. So another enzyme, DNA gyrase, works out in front, cutting and resealing the DNA to relieve all that stress. It's kind of like untangling a twisted phone cord. All right, the stage is set, the machinery is in place, and the track is clear. Let's move on to phase two, elongation. This is the main event, the actual synthesis of the new DNA strands. And the star of this phase is a massive enzyme complex called the DNA polymerase three holoenzyme. Now, holoenzyme is just a fancy way of saying the whole, complete, ready-to-work machine. This is our master builder. Its job is to read the original template strand and add the correct new nucleotides one by one at an absolutely incredible speed. Now, DNA polymerase 3 is a real stickler for the rules. It has a strict sense of direction. It always reads the template from the 3' prime to the 5' prime end, which means it builds the new strand from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. And maybe its most critical feature is its proofreading ability. As it adds each new base, it double-checks its work. If it makes a mistake, it backs up and fixes it immediately. This is just incredible. It brings the error rate way down, from about one mistake in 100,000 to less than one in 10 million. That's what we mean by high-fidelity replication. Okay, so this next part is where things can get a little tricky, but stick with me, because this is a classic exam topic. The two strands of the DNA double helix run in opposite directions. They're anti-parallel. And since DNA poly 3 can only build in one direction, the cell has to use two different strategies to copy both strands at the same time. Let's break it down side by side. On one hand, you've got the leading strand. This one's the easy one. It's synthesized in one long, continuous piece, and it moves right towards the replication fork. 
It only needs one little RNA primer to get started, but the other strand, the lagging strand, is synthesized away from the fork. This means it has to be made in a bunch of short, disconnected pieces called Okazaki fragments, and each one of these little fragments needs its very own RNA primer. So, we have all these little Okazaki fragments on the lagging strand. What happens next? We can't just leave them like that, right? They need to be stitched together into one continuous strand. This is a three-step cleanup process. First, enzymes like RNase H and another polymerase, DNA polymerase I, come in and remove all those RNA primers. Then, DNA polymerase I fills in the gaps with the proper DNA nucleotides. And finally, an enzyme called DNA ligase acts like molecular glue, sealing the final little nick in the backbone. Okay, we've initiated, we've elongated, we are in the home stretch now. It's time for the final phase, termination. This is where the whole process comes to a halt, and the cell makes sure it has two separate complete chromosomes ready for division. You might be wondering, how does it know when to stop? Well, it's not random. The E. coli chromosome has these built-in stop signs called termination, or TER sequences. A protein called TUS binds to these TER sites and acts like a one-way gate. It lets the replication fork go through in one direction, but blocks it from the other, essentially trapping the forks and forcing them to meet in a specific region. But wait, even after all that, there's one last puzzle to solve. Because we started with a circular chromosome, when we finish replicating it, we end up with two new circular chromosomes that are interlinked, like two rings of a chain. This state is called catenation, and obviously, the cell has to figure out how to untangle them before it can divide. And the solution is, honestly, pretty genius. Another enzyme, topoisomerase 4, comes to the rescue. What it does is amazing. It makes a clean, temporary, double-stranded cut in one of the DNA rings. Then it passes the other ring right through the opening and, finally, perfectly reseals the break. Just like that, it neatly separates, or decatenates, the two chromosomes and the mission is complete. Whew! Okay, that was a deep dive, I know. So let's do a quick mission debrief. This is your high-yield summary, the kind of thing that's perfect for cramming right before an exam. Let's review the all-star replication team. So let's run down the list of our key players one more time. DNA A is the initiator. It gets everything started at Ori C. DNA B is the helicase. It unzips the DNA. DNA gyrase is the stress reliever. SSP proteins are the stabilizers. DNA Pol 3 is the master builder. DNA Pol 1 is the cleanup crew, removing primers and filling gaps. DNA ligase is the glue that seals the nicks. And finally, topoisomerase 4 is the separator that untangles the final product. Every single one has a vital role to play. So what we've just walked through is this incredibly beautiful, efficient system that works perfectly for a simple circular chromosome. But it really makes you wonder, right? How does life take these fundamental principles, the unzipping, the building, the proofreading, and scale them up to handle the massive complexity of the multiple linear chromosomes that you find in eukaryotes, like in our own cells? Well, that's a whole other mission for another day.